All right. Uh, this is Mike Davis with Lovecraft Ezine, and today is Groundhog Day, I guess, February the second, two thousand fourteen, yes, and this is our regular Sunday video chat. Uh, we do this every Sunday at six o'clock Eastern. You can watch us live. So if you're if you're watching this later, watching the recorded version of this, uh, feel free to watch us live every every Sunday. Um, just go to LovecraftZine.com and and uh, click on video chat, and there'll be there'll be details there for you. Um, today we're going to talk to this gentleman here, Juan Vu. Um, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for being here, Juan. I really appreciate it. Um, and Juan is the director of a really great uh, movie called uh, Di Farbe, and I don't know if I'm saying that right, but it's uh, The Color Out of Space, an ad adaptation of The Color Out of Space, uh, and an upcoming movie called The Dreamlands. So, um, Juan, I've told you this privately, but I, I think, and I know these guys and a lot of other people agree with me, that uh, your Color Out of Space movie was one of the best Lovecraftian films I've ever seen. Oh, thanks. Thank you very much. So you all have seen it? You all saw the yeah. film? Yes. Great movie. Ah, awesome. Thanks. I, I have not. Which uh, I know. <laughs> you know, the, the thing is, when I've read that story before, I've always thought about a movie adaptation. I thought, how do you, how do you solve the problem of the color? How do you represent that, that color on film? And the way that uh, one solved it uh, was it's a black and white film, and if I remember correctly, that's the only color in the film. Is, am I remembering that right, Juan? Yes, absolutely. Yes, yes. So yeah. that, that was the, the the idea in the beginning when we started thinking about making this movie, and I think we wouldn't have dared to to try to make an adaptation if there hasn't been that that particular idea. Yeah. Yeah. That was very very important for me. Was yeah, go ahead, man. That that idea I thought was brilliant because it reminded me of uh, Schindler's List when the little girl had the red coat because the, it made it was so striking. Oh yes, yes, definitely. Yeah. Um, I I uh, I was just wondering whose idea was this? Was this uh, something that you and the writer came up with, or or how did it come about? It was just brilliant. Yeah, it just it just came up. You know, it was. I was talking with Jan, he, he's the co-producer, and he's also the visual effects uh, guy. He's, he's doing the, the 3D animation and, and stuff. And we, we pondered uh, how to make this particular story into a movie, what would be uh, a way to, to tell the story. And I think the most important thing is the question of how to tell the, the alien nature of, of that, that car that is not from this planet. And so there was the idea. And um, yeah, you're right. There are many films that are using quite the same technique to, to um, take out other colors and or all colors uh, to do with black and white and um, to, to put emphasis on, on, on some um, visual elements um, if they take the color in for that part again. And yeah, Schindler's List is an example. And there was a French uh, science fiction movie called Renaissance that was screened uh, back then, and I saw that as well. And there was a, a short film that you all probably don't know because uh, it was made by a friend of mine. Uh, he's a student, animation student, and he also played with that um, visual theme. And so there, yeah, that, that was the influence back then. There's also a movie. Uh Maybe you guys can help me remember the name of it. I actually own it. I can't remember it right now. It's about uh, uh, Toby Maguire stars in it, where they they enter into this, they get sucked into this. Pleasant Hill. Pleasant Hill. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, it that that a bit too. You remember the scene where um, the, the one of the characters in the movie is is looking at a rose bush and he sees um, one rose that, that's red. That really stood out to me. Um, and it, that, that just came to mind when I saw your film. Um, by the way, for everybody watching, if you uh, want to buy uh, The Color Out of Space, which is it is it really is a really great movie, I posted about it uh, today. I, I put a link to uh, to your website, Juan, so they could buy the DVD there. So, um, so tell so us. Uh, what are you thinking of the the choice of color? Do you do you like what we 
Pardon me? <laughs> yes, yes, because it, it doesn't... It's not something uh, right in the middle of the primary visual spectrum. It's like on the far end of um, the wavelength that we can perceive. Right. So it's very close to violet, pushing into ultraviolet that we couldn't see. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I, yeah, yeah, I made some research, and uh, I think it's the color that uh, you, you can experience the, the least in, in nature. So it's really that color hue that is uh, the strangest for us. And I made uh, a small gamble. I asked my, my team and made some sketches, what, mm -hmm. which color would, would work the best. And I think it was that color, pink, purplish, was the color they all disliked the most. And so I knew that should be uh, the choice. I also right thought that like, if, human, if uh, life on Earth, you think of it as being sort of ambient temperature, or it would show up, say, red or in the infrared, so the fact that you put it on the other end of the color spectrum also makes it all the more alien. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I recently um, learned that actually the color is not existing, it seems. In, it's, it's, a, it's fabricated in, in the brain because it's minus green. It's the negative of green. But there actually aren't uh, purple uh, wavelengths. Uh, I'm, I'm not a physicist. Uh, um, you know, physics, I'm not an expert, but there was one guy in Stockholm, Sweden, where, where we screened the, the film, and I think he's a student, he was quite young, uh, and he, he explained it to me. I didn't understand everything, but it seems to be uh, right. If you Google for it, um, that pink is not a true color, and that it's minus green, you will find some uh, scientific explanation for that. In my understanding, you're right. You, did you just say that you did some research and... Um the color that you used appears less in nature than any other color? Yeah, that was my research um, when we made the film, or before we started shooting. Um, oh no, it, it was after shooting, it was uh, in the, in the post-production process. But this uh, thing about minus green, negative green, that uh, I didn't know back then. Yeah. So it's yeah. a coincidence, and it, it fits quite well, because it seems to be, you can say that there is no color pink, because it's only it's really in our brain. It's it's a compensation of, of um, yeah of something. <laughs> That's extreme. I don't know if, but yeah, it seems to be right. Yeah. Um so tell us a little bit about tell us about the Dreamlands. Um, tell us what whatever you want to tell us about the movie and how it came about. Uh, where are you going with the Dreamlands? Because there's so many different ways you could go with a movie like this. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. so, so the question is, in which uh, direction? Uh, yeah, if you want to talk about the plot or, or whatever. <laughs> ah, okay, the plot. Um, well, I think, that, I think that the first thing is that, for me, it was important to, to step back and not take one particular story of, of Lovecraft, because mm -hmm. that was the initial idea. I mean, it, it makes sense. We, we, did, um, we made the color out of space, and now... What, what's next? Uh, it makes sense to make another Lovecraft movie, Lovecraft yeah, movie, yeah. and we, we pondered um, the temple because there are Germans in the film. It would fit, you know, we, we could make, uh, and I would love to make a film about a German submarine right. in, the, in the First World War. It's a nice setting, but... Um, you just need a yes, submarine with windows. Come. Pardon? You just need a submarine with windows to do the temple. <laughs> Yeah, I think, I don't think is, it, is it right that there's a window? I think it's... In the, in the story there is, yeah. I, yeah, I just don't but it can't be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, I think it's also on. not right because I think the submarines in the First World War, they uh, never went down very far below. Um, I think they used it as, as ships most times. So it, it's, it's not really correct what Lovecraft uh, had written. I mean, he, all the stereotypes about Germans in there also aren't. <laughs> no, it's a great story. I just, we always... Uh, I, yeah, just I like this. Uh, there are many parts um, that I really like that are scary and, and I would love to do it, but it's really complicated because you need a submarine and you have to tell a story um, out on the sea and, and below sea level and it's very hard. And I think the, the biggest problem is the script because you need a good script. And the temple is... Um, has a very um, fast ending. It, it, the story is not not you know evolving. It's right. uh, stopping right 
when it's getting uh, very intense and in interesting. I mean, that's usual usual approach of H.P. Lovecraft. It, it's, it stops there. Yeah. And you would have to invent a whole new third act to make it into a full feature. And yeah, so it was too complicated and so we stopped from that idea. And so then what we tried to do with the Dreamlands then? then You're European, yeah, you don't need a third people. act. <laughs> the, the, what is that? I said you're a European. You don't need a third act. This is in America, where you have <laughs> yeah. to deliver a nice, nice, neat little three-act job. Um, there's there's mountains of brilliant European film, um, classic film, important film, where we don't get a third act. You know. Uh, but you're yeah, right. Ma but make still it you, need, you need enough um, story to tell a full feature, you know, two two hours yeah. or ninety minutes, and the temple is, is more more or less a short story, a short yeah. film. Yeah. And I don't like short films that much, so yeah. Yeah, and 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 wa working with the constraints of water, I mean that's infamously difficult yeah. and expensive, so. So about yeah, who knows? Perhaps uh, if the Dreamlands is not coming, uh, we will go back to the temple and try to find uh, some approach to, 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 to do that. I mean, it could be possible with you know visual effects and, and, and so on. Yeah. So um, what's what story are you telling with the Dreamlands movie? Yeah, the Dreamlands. Um, yeah, what's important about the Dreamlands is that. Um, I was thinking about which story you could take, but there are also most of the stories are quite short, and and so there there was the idea: what if I go back, uh, step back from the idea to take one particular story and make an adaptation of that story? What if I try to to only um, take the the canvas to take the the landscape, what um, H.P. Lovecraft uh, created, and and put a new story into it and, and uh, weave it into the themes and the topics that H.P. Uh, Lovecraft uh, played with and, and, and established. Right. And that was very interesting because no one else, I think, tried to do something like that. And that's always driving me, you know, to make something that is that's fresh and, and new in some way. And still, it's uh, close to what H.P. Lovecraft um, would have liked. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Perhaps I, I really like that idea. Yeah, and I think yeah. it, it fits to the dreamers because it, you know the, the color of space. It was very important for me to to stay very close to the original story because it's a marvelous, uh, fantastic story, one of the best uh, in in that genre. And the dreamlands, it's more open. It's it's a really uh, open space for me. I think I can I can play around there. It's a playground. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I got to say, I was interested. The trailer, trailer number two, made me think of the story The White Ship a little bit. because Maybe it was because it was dealing with someone in a lighthouse. Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, I would say there are four or five stories that are very important to me. Um, Selfies is, is particularly uh, very, very important for me because it's one of my favorite stories. I li like it because there you have um, the old man and something that is quite uncommon for H.P. Lovecraft. There's some kind of human connection there. Um, it's really emotional. I think it's really, really emotional, the ending. and It's very sad and melancholic, mm. and I love that story. And yeah, with the white ship is very important. Uh, also, the strange high house in the mist, obviously. And um, yeah, the dream quest, um, because there you see the whole uh, structure, the whole um, vision of, of H.P. Lovecraft. It's not a very good story, I would say, but you see the, the great, uh, fantastic ideas. Yeah. Well, what, uh, without giving away any spoilers, of course, um, can you tell us a little bit about the, the plot of your movie? Yeah, well, um, in a nutshell, it's about um, an orphan. He's, he's a young guy, and he has um, 
is traumatized because of uh, his past, and he's meeting an old man, and you see that in the, the second teaser, mm -hmm. an old man that is also very mysterious, and uh, he's, he's shunned by other people in the, in the village, and he, he has been a captain, uh, and he has traveled uh, around the world, uh, he was searching for strange artifacts, and, and he's very, very strange, uh, terrible old man, and somehow he, he's connecting to that um, orphan, and is taking him to the dreamlands where he is uh, a king and he's searching for a successor and he, he wants him to be or he's testing him if, if he could be the successor and and that's the that story about um, our, our hero and he has to ultimately decide if he wants to expand and build upon the dreamlands as the next king probably or if he um, choose another path and, and uh, helps to destroy them. That sounds and great. I, I have to say that I I really applaud your decision. I like your the way you're going with this, not going with any particular story, but you know, with the, using the Dreamlands as a theme. Um, that's great. So. Yeah, it's so it's yeah. And as a filmmaker, it's so much fun. You know, it's it's. Um, I love this project. I would I love if uh, I hope we can do it because uh, then the next two or three years, yeah, it's 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 yeah. It's making a big fantasy epic movie with uh, images you can create only in film and and yeah. fulfill you know, a, ask, fulfilling um, in life. What is your background? I mean, what was your training? How did you get into making movies and? How did it bring around you to? How did you bring it around to Lovecraft? Oh you well, know, we don't, um, you don't have much of a bio on our uh, IMDb. No, <laughs> no. Um, yeah, well, I, I started like like most guys, I think, in in my um, of my generation, because um, there was the digital film revolution. I think we we felt uh, we could make. Um, Movies by ourselves um, with digital cameras, uh, yeah. And then we saw that it's quite naive. It's not that easy to make to make uh, really professional movies. But I started with uh, you know buying a camera and and shooting short films, and becoming quite <laughs> obsessed. With it. Yeah. And my first film was uh, Damnatus, uh, Warhammer Forty Thousand. Um, Film, a fan film, and that was the a very big project. And uh, I don't know if you do you know it. Warhammer Four Thousand is a is a, a tabletop game. Um, no uh, what? War game. Oh yeah, I've heard of it. With miniatures and you have tanks and you have right, the, right, the, yeah, the, yeah. Spells. Yeah. yeah, it's it has a very um, huge universe full of um, different races, different. Um, Factions of, of humanity, and it's very, very dark. And that's uh, Is this one of the Warhammer, like the Tyranids and the Orcs and stuff. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, your your that. first movie was was in that universe. Yeah, and it was uh, I think the first fan film ever made, and it got uh, not cancelled. What's the word? But it was forbidden to to be published by Games Workshop, <laughs> the company, <laughs> because of uh, copyright issues. Not because it's bad. I, I don't know. No. It's really not about the quality. I mean, it's a fan film, so it's not really, not really good. But I think if you if you watch it, the yeah, the actors are not that great, and the direction is not also, and the script is not that great. But I think you can see that um, there's the ambition to to make something that is uh, perhaps great. <laughs> and um, I think we also nailed the atmosphere. That's I think that's a trait that, that you can see in my my work that um, I tried to get close to the original work, uh, like the way we did uh, the color of space try to get to stay to the true to the core yeah that's just dripping with the atmosphere that's a, it's that yeah and they're not the same I mean, if, you, if you talk to fans one of 40,000 fans um, they appreciate it they know that it's hard to make a good movie and um, there's a official film that was made some couple of years after ours and there's also some gossip that it that our film was forbidden because of the official film that they don't want um, competition, or also they, they want to have a clear license, um, you know, the rights um, yeah. to be protected and so on. And that film is also not, not very good, but um, yeah, fans have a problem with that film because they changed um, 
they changed some some um, ca canon uh, things, cano canonical things. Yeah. You know, Whoa, changing. Yeah. Canon. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and that was upsetting some fans, and I understand it because I'm a fan as, as well. And they changed things, and I thought you can't do that. And we stayed close to uh, the universe, worse, yeah. And so that's what fans uh, appreciate. And yeah, it's it's a funny th story. Um, yeah, and after that, I made uh, the color of space. Um, how, how did you get interested in Lovecraft? One, how, how, when did you start reading Lovecraft, and and how did that all begin for you? Yeah, that's uh, that's a story that. Um, Jan, uh, I told you about him, he's my co-producer. I met him yeah. at uh, University of Media, where I studied, and um, that was because of Damnatos. He, he's a 3D artist, um, and yeah, we, we talked about my, my film project, and he, he loves science fiction and fantasy as well, and so he wanted to contribute and uh, make some uh, 3D models for Damnatos, and, and so we get to know each other and became friends, and we also made um, had an internship at the same visual effects company mm -hmm. here in Stuttgart, Germany. And uh, yeah, he, he gave me some books, Lovecraft, mm -hmm. and then it uh, began. And uh, so it's the same place where we began uh, thinking about uh, the color space. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, where Is that where you, you are currently in Stuttgart? Pardon? Where are, in Stuttgart? are you in Stuttgart? It's, it's close to Stuttgart. Um, it's it's a city next to Stuttgart, uh, Ludwigsburg. It's also a famous film school here and um, yeah, media school. Okay, I live in Berlin, so that's why I was curious. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay. Where are you? Uh, where are you in regards to the Dreamlands? How how much of it has been filmed? Oh well, we only shot the the teaser trailer. So there will be a third teaser trailer that will be released. Um, mm -hmm. Soon, uh, we, were ch we are just uh, working on the last shots, and I uh, hope you will like it. It will be, again, somewhat different to the other two teasers, so that was the plan, to have three teasers that are showing uh, different aspects. And yeah, well, I hope you will enjoy it, and yeah, there's not much more. There will be some other stuff that we can show during the campaign in, in March. But uh, it's nothing that we have shot that's uh, for the for the for the movie. Um, it's so, are, are you doing? Do you have the funds? Are you going to do a Kickstarter campaign, or what, yes. what's the plan? Yes, that's that's the plan to start a Kickstarter uh, Kickstarter campaign and try to get uh, the funding to make this film. Okay, that's great. How, how, how much money are you going to shoot for? Oh well, um, we are still making calculations. You know, uh, the different. Uh, it's quite. Um, yeah, it's a tedious task because we have to arrive at a number that is reasonable. You know that you can trust me that we can make a, a feature film with mm -hmm. that amount of money. And on the other hand, it doesn't have. It can't be too high because it, it's. You know, I, I don't know if there are enough uh, Lovecraft fans out there. Who, who are willing to invest, but probably we can't go to a yeah, very high six digits number. It's, it's impossible, probably, to well, get there's that. There's a lot of Lovecraft fans out there, but um, yeah. But yes, yeah. you're right. It's at, uh, calculating. That's a very tedious process. Yeah, the problem with Kickstarter is if you don't meet the, the target, you lose everything. And so right. we have to. Right. To get a number, a target that is somewhere in between, and you know the, the story is there. We've written this story, but still you can make decisions that uh, cost cost less or more. Like for example, take a, a Shantak bird. Uh, Lovecraft is describing a Shantak bird in, in the stories, and we are thinking about um, how to do that. Uh, we could take a visual effects model, and then I had to have, would have to ask. Uh, for the artist, how much would he or she um, take take a charge for for his work or her, her work? But um, then you could also make uh, it into a puppet, like you know Star Wars. Uh, there were, were some mm -hmm. creatures in there, and I also love the look of of uh, practical, uh, real real stuff, real um, you know puppet work. Mm -hmm. And then would ha would have to ask another artist um, how much would that cost and the materials and so on. And so we have to yeah try to find out what what's what's a good plan and what, how much would um, cost. Yeah. And when are you hoping to get the Kickstarter uh, started? 
Um, I think we, will, we should start uh, on, on March 1st, so that's the plan. But I'm not sure if we, if we can uh, really make that. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, uh, doing a Kickstarter is a lot of work. <laughs> so yeah, yeah definitely. Um, and we also have to set up because we um, we are here in Germany, so we need um, help by at least one American uh, to to set everything up. And Andrew Migliore will will help us. I think you know him. He's uh, the founder of. Um, the HP Lovecraft Film Festival, and he will deal with. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, stuff Andrew. So sure. Yeah. Right. Well, that's yeah. nice. He, he's a nice guy. Very yeah. nice. Yeah, yeah. And he loves the temple. He, he would love to make. He has, I think he has a script for the temple. And uh, yeah. Well, I'll tell you when you when you begin the Kickstarter, um, please let me know. And you know, and uh, you know, you did such wonderful. You did such a wonderful job with. The color out of space that Lovecraft fans will know that a movie, a Dreamlands movie, is going to have that same quality. You know, um, you know, you've shown Lovecraft fans what you can do with the Lovecraft story, and it's something new. You know, it's never been done before, and um, yeah, and if you are. Um, investing in the movie, you are purchasing two things: uh, that there will be a Dreamlands film for the first time, mm -hmm. and also um, that it's been done by fans in a free way. You know, you're buying freedom, artistic freedom. Because normally, I would have to to ask um, TV broadcasters or established producers, and you know how it works in the film industry. They 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 try to get it um, into a mainstream. They, get, they try to get it streamlined, that it works for a bigger audience, obviously. And uh, if we can make it with Kickstarter, then it's really you Lovecraft fans and we together and, and, and try to create something that, that is appealing to us. Well, I, have, I have a thought. Yeah. If, if, if before you do the Kickstarter, um, Mike has been showing films on Saturday night, um, Lovecraftian films. Mm -hmm. And as there may be quite a few Lovecraftians who haven't seen your film, before you, the inception of your Kickstarter, um, would it be possible for Mike to show it once in a format like this, which is not recorded, just so Lovecraftians who might want to contribute to your Kickstarter can see an example of the type of work you're doing? Other than the trailers themselves. Um, so you mean? Uh, you call in, them the color of space. Saturday or? night chats. He would show the farm, and so Lovecraftian fans could actually see the film once, and then a week or two later is when your Kickstarter would begin, and those Lovecraftians who hadn't seen your film would understand. Just what you what what the quality of your work is. It, yeah, sure, sure. It, uh, it's good it's idea. possible after having seen what what you've done with A, they'd be much more inclined to contribute so that you could produce B. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we can we can talk about just, that too. Just a thought. I've got a question from uh, somebody in the audience. Uh, they typed this question on the message board. Uh, Gary Graybill wants to ask you, uh, does Mr. Vu find it difficult to translate the concepts of the Lovecraftian universe to the shorthand of screenplay writing, and does he do a lot of stor storyboarding? So the second question was storyboarding, uh, you know, making... Yeah, do you do a lot of storyboarding was the second question. Yeah, yeah, definitely, but I'm not a, not very good in, in drawing, so um, it's more scribbles and just uh, you know get uh, a rough sketch of where he where everyone is standing or the camera yeah. angle and so on. So it's not really art. But uh, the other thing is very interesting. Yes, it's it's kind of I think that's the main the main question: how to get Lovecraftian um, themes into a movie. I think it, it would have to be in between the lines. It can't be about a cosmic horror all the time. Mm -hmm. So in this case, we also would, I would also say it's um, it's mainly a, fan, a fantasy epic with uh, 
probably yeah um, quite traditional storytelling mm -hmm. but the interesting thing for the Lovecraft fans are the it's, it's the villain the villain um, the high priest and what he's standing for and what he's saying and and um, yeah, I don't want to give away too much. Um, well, that's fine. But, you know, what what you've told us so far, though, is is honestly, it's very, very intriguing. I mean, this is a movie that I would really, really want to see. Um, you know, so when when you do begin your Kickstarter, uh, Joe had a good idea um, asking that. We can talk about that a little bit later in private if you want. But th that's a good idea. And, you know, we want to do anything we can to help make this happen. Uh, there's just not enough good Lovecraftian movies out there, so... Um. Yeah, I think it's it's a very good... Um, that, that's good that you're saying that, uh, because I read that you are also producing uh, short film short films based on yeah. on um, stories that are pus published on the Lovecraft e -Sign. Yes, yeah. that's a very, very... Um, I think that's um, the beginning of a new new age or new new, new phase uh, that, that Creative fans uh, and talented um, aspiring filmmakers can r really make make um, yeah the but difference. Uh, you're the right. Thing. I mean, Lovecraft fans—they're really hungry for for good Lovecraftian movies. Um, you know, they want to see them, and they want to see them done right. Yeah. So. Right, yeah. Mainly, we uh, want your Kickstarter to be successful. I've seen several yeah. good film projects tank because the Kickstarter wasn't managed. Properly, I've also seen one where they actually conducted a second Kickstarter to raise more funds, and both were successful. It it really becomes a matter of building a really excited community, who are all like gunning for these stretch goals for you. Yeah, good rewards right. are, are really important too. Mm, yeah, yeah, we will try. We give our best. Um, yeah, it's it's a small team here, so. It's it's a test for me. It's the first time I've never done crowdfunding before, and so um, yeah, I hope it will work. But you know, if it doesn't work, it's not that it's not a, such a big tragedy because it's fun. It has been fun to make this teaser trailer and to, mm -hmm. to make the concerts and think about this film, and perhaps it will be, become something later. I mean, if the trailers are out there on the internet. Perhaps some producer will, will see it uh, next year, and, and, and you right. know, I don't you know. Don't know. Really give up about it. I you think don't, you don't have to give up because uh, I've seen people retool their campaign, relaunch two months later, and then succeed. From yeah. What yeah. They learn. yeah. You know, yeah. I don't. I, I hate for you to have a setback, but gosh, it's like all of us sort of feel invested now. We really want to see your movie made. Definitely. <laughs> mm. uh, Gwen Callahan's watching. She's on the message board. Juan, she says, uh, hi Juan from the HP Lovecraft Film Festival. We're looking forward to your Kickstarter and the production of the Dreamlands. So Yeah, thanks. Hi Gwen. <laughs> <laughs> Have to so, see her again. Yeah. Um, yeah, honestly, uh, it's from what you told us, it's just really intriguing. I really want to see the movie. So you know, definitely keep us informed, keep me informed about the Kickstarter. Um, do you know what any of your rewards for the Kickstarter will be yet? Have you lined those up yet? Or are you still working on that? Yeah, we're still working on it. Um, you know, also trying to get uh, the prices with the manufacturers and so on. So it's yeah, also much work to do. And there's some usual stuff like you know, an art book or a T-shirt. <laughs> But also some some special uh, stuff. But I think uh, I would give out too too much uh, now. So yeah, you will have to wait and see. So, yeah. so but there will be some interesting. I think yeah, I will, it will fit to the theme. It would fit to the Dreamers theme, and yeah, some nice ideas there. What were you you saying, have Mark? a small team. Do you do your own writing, and uh, are the actors your friends? Um, oh no no no! Uh, the actors in um, the Color of Space, Die Farbe, uh -huh. they all have been. Um, are um, professional actors, actually, yes. So the, the friend stuff was uh, Donatus, the fan film. Yeah. Uh -huh. I was good friends. But, but now I'm only working with uh, professional actors. Yeah. Well, I highly encourage everyone watching to um, click on the link uh, in my website, the first, fo first post up there right now on February the 2nd. Um, I've got a link to, uh, to buy... Um, D. Farbe, the color out of space. And it, it's very, very good. If you're a Lovecraft fan, um, you like 
watching good Lovecraftian movies, this is one you definitely want on your shelf. So, um, Juan, do you want to say anything more about the Dreamlands movie, or do we have any other questions for Juan? I know it's late where you are, so I know you said you don't want to talk too long because you have to get to bed and go to work. Yeah, it's all right. It's, it's half past uh, 12 now, so yeah, we can talk till to 1 a.m. Um, okay. if you want to, if you have questions. Uh, well, perhaps about the color of space again. I don't know. Um, I I have a question. Right. I always I always like the uh, insect scene. Was the insect flying around the woman's head? What, ah, what? The, the giant w w wasp. Yes. That was yeah. creepy. Yeah. What props? It was also fun to make the sound design for her because you know it's it's always it's, it's fun. It's, as a filmmaker, it's so rewarding to 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 work so hard on on getting something right and and get. Um, the stuff that you have in your brain um, on the screen, and also the sounds, and it, yeah, it was it was a hard fight with our sound designer. Also, how how should it sound like such a giant wasp, and 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 how should it look like? I mean, I was struggling with Jan because he had different um, different design, and in the end, it's his design in, in the film. Yeah, uh, my design was a little bit even more even more um, even stranger. Yeah. Uh. Kevin Lama on the message board says, um, aside from here, how are you spreading word about the Kickstarter? I've noticed word of mouth has contributed to the success of the Kickstarters that I've backed. Yeah, we, would, we, we tried with Facebook, but you know, the, the problem with Facebook uh, is, um, I don't know if you have seen, there was a very good video about the problem with Facebook right now, that you actually have to pay. Um, if you want to 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 go sure that everyone who is a fan of your uh, page is actually seeing your news, and that's ridiculous, um, because if you don't click uh, uh, the like button uh, rec regularly, um, Facebook is thinking that that you don't you, that you're not interested in use of that page anymore. Yeah, but that's the, the problem because like not everyone button. is clicking like me all the yeah. time. Yeah. You either have to click like or Something that not a lot of people know about, which I would hope I hope everyone that likes Lovecraft Easy and would do this, uh, is when you hover over the like button. There's w one of the things in the drop-down menu is uh, show notifications, and then you get yeah. notifications every time there's a post. But not a lot of people know about that. Yeah, yeah. And Facebook changed it, I think, one one year ago or one and a half year ago. And uh, yeah, that's a it's a really big problem, I think. Uh, so it's hard to to um, to spread the word on Facebook, but still all people are there, so I don't know. Um, yeah. Yeah. Won't be easy. Yeah, I have a lot of people that, that see my post, but it, you know, definitely not everyone that clicks the like button is seeing every post. Yeah, you're you're definitely right. Yeah, so in the end it's it's all about you know word of mouth. Um, Everybody who wants this film to be made uh, should, should try to get uh, all his friends and, and colleagues and family members yeah, rally a bit um, and and try to get um, yeah people excited. Well, we'll do what we can on this end. Um, I know that I know that my readers would definitely like to see this get made. Uh, the, tra the the teaser trailers so far are just great. So, yeah. It sounds like you had a lot of fun making them. So, uh, we have any more questions for Juan? Yeah, I I kind of do. I was sort of interested that um, you moved. Uh, Defarba to to Deutschland because um, it, it, there's nothing wrong with the choice. I was wondering why the the setting in World War II was that just so you could have an ex a reason that they would come back to Miskatonic University. Well, um, there were several reasons for that. Um, I think mainly practical reasons. Um, shooting in Germany obviously is, is easier for us um, than, than going to uh, New England and shooting there. And um, the other thing is uh, moving, yeah, we moved closer to our time, to, um, to the now, so that the ending of the story is working better, I think, if, if the, the, how's it called, um, the, the, the lake that is created, created um, Mm -hmm. with a dam, that uh, that it's closer to us now, nowadays. Um, the second uh, time um, level um, in, in um, Die Farbe is in the 70s, so it's only 40 years ago. Uh -huh. I, I felt that it's, it's scarier if it's not too far away. 
Do you, do you know what, what I mean? That it's, it's, you know, it was only 40 or 30 years ago that this thing was built, and we are drinking the water now. So it, it works for me better this way. And the other thing is, it's, it's, it's just cheaper to, to make the film, uh, since it's much easier to get costumes and props um, out of the 70s and the 30s here in Germany. Uh, I don't know if it's the same in the United, yeah. the United States. But it's very hard to get stuff that is from 1890 or 1900. That's uh, much, much harder. Uh, Juan, I've got a couple more questions for you that Matt's question made me think of. Uh, I guess my first question is, I enjoyed The Color Out of Space so much that, you know, I thought, geez, I wish, I hope this guy could just keep making Lovecraft movies. Now, obviously, the next thing on your list is The Dreamlands. Um, Hypothetically, if the Dreamlands gets made and it's successful, do you want to make more Lovecraftian adaptations? Do you want to make more movies that are are just based on the themes of Lovecraft? Have Have you thought about this at all? Well, there are other other um, film ideas in my head, mm -hmm. so I wouldn't say that I would uh, only be the, the, the Lovecraft filmmaker, but it's definitely something that I'm I'm drawn to. Mm -hmm. I can relate to you know the the, the main themes and topics uh, that are described in, in Lovecraft's stories, so yeah, uh, I'm definitely a hardcore fan, so yeah. Um, Why are you drawn to Lovecraft stories? What about the themes of Lovecraft appeals to you as a storyteller and filmmaker? Well, you know, most horror films are, are based on, how or should I, um, how can I coin it, um, more or less physical fear, it's, it's mm -hmm. more or less um, you do, that you're afraid of being murdered or, or destroyed in a physical right. way. So there are murderers or there are monsters chasing you or the pretty girl and it's all about that stuff and it's good. I, I like those movies. Um, mm -hmm. But Lovecraft is about uh, you know more existential fear. It's a more a phys philosophical fear. It's more about what if this world we are living here is, or that, or what if science is not not true? Because we are all nowadays more or less believers in science, mm -hmm. and and Lafka was a big science um, man of science, and um, me as well. And, and what if that is not true? And there's something out there that we can't describe and we can't understand it, and it's much more powerful than anything else. So it's it's a different kind of fear, and I I love the idea of that and try to get that into a movie so that uh, people will be scared in, in that way. Yeah. Right. What, um, I'm glad that you did. This is not a criticism. Uh, but why did you, why was your first uh, Lovecraftian movie, The Color Out of Space? Is that your favorite Lovecraft story or is that the one you felt would work the best? Or I would say it's, the, it's definitely the, the favorite story. Um, mm -hmm. I was reading it um, on, the, on the way to, the, to work. Um, like I told you, where I was working um, as an intern with uh, Jan together, right. and I just finished that uh, story um, in, the, in the train and stepped out and, and went into office and talked with Jan um, about that story, and I was so mesmerized um, of, of that um, yeah story, and I, I loved um, the thing. The thing about um, the color of the space is that. The creature is not particularly evil. It's just a creature. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, you can't tell in the story if there is an intelligence behind the color that is coming from outer space. It, it could be a fungus. It could be just a cloud that is just uh, trying to yeah reproduce. And uh, I love that notion. That something that is so scary to us. Uh, it is uh, that it's just nature. It's just a part of the universe, like we are, and it's not um, an evil spirit in in it. And and uh, yeah. Have you, like uh, have you read much Ray Bradbury, but by any chance? Um, um, only Fahrenheit four five one. Um, Fahrenheit four fifty one. Yeah. Uh, you know the color out of space. I don't know about you guys. Every. Uh, it sometimes makes me, it rem, it's not exactly the same, but it reminds me of a story that Ray Bradbury wrote a little bit. I can't think of the title right now. It's a short story. Uh, but it's basically about uh, some entity or formless thing, like in the color out of space, 
uh, and it's narrating the story, and it, it says, I'm simply waiting. I don't know what I am. Um, uh, I don't know if you guys have read that, but it's a really good story. I recommend it. Uh, it's not like nobody here has read it but me, but it makes me, when I think of the color out of space, I always think of that Ray Bradbury story. wish I could think of the name. It's somewhere in this huge book. <laughs> uh, yeah, I should read, read more, but, uh, you know, there's so not enough time to, to read everything that should be read. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes I wish I could just sit around and read and do nothing else. <laughs> do we have any more questions for Juan, you guys? Um, so if you get this done, uh, is there any chance that you would get backing of a bigger studio to scale up, do you think? Are you getting any notice in Germany from uh, in your industry? Yeah, definitely. I mean, that that's part of the plan. Um, if we get the funding by the fans, that is the minimum target. That's the minimum um, amount of money and budget that I would say and feel comfortable to, to make this film, that I can say, okay, I can make this film with that amount of money. But then we can also go into ne negotiations with, um, here in Germany, it's possible to um, apply for for subsidies. No, it's not subsidies, subsidies. it's funding. It's funding. You, you get money from the government like to make oh. Pardon? Like a grant? Um, yes, yeah, it's yeah, yeah, it's, yeah it's, it's the same way. So you apply, you, you tell them your story, what you are going for, and mm -hmm. if they like it and it, they think it's, it's a worthwhile film and it's a film that can create um, something um, and make some money, uh, you get the money by the government. So mm -hmm. that's something we will apply for. And you are, I, th I would say you are more respected if you have something in your pockets as well. If I go to the office and talk with those people and I have nothing, um, it's, it's quite hard to, to get um, to get the right. money. Yeah. But okay. if I say, I'm going to make a film, and I, I will do this film, um, then they can think about, okay, he's doing this film, uh, even if we don't give him money, but if we give him money, he can make it even better. And that's good for the German film industry and so on. So yeah, we will try to to bolster that, that, that budget and, and give, to make it even bigger and to make it into a more safer and, and, and yeah, bigger project. Right. Very well, exciting. Good go best ahead, of luck. We'll be behind you. Yeah. So, yeah. We'll do we'll definitely do what we can to, to help you promote it, Juan. So um, you know, just uh, keep me posted when you're about to to go live with the Kickstarter, and I'll, I'll post about it. And I know these guys will pr promote it too. So yeah, spread the word. Thank Definitely. you. Yeah. Um, well, thanks for being here, Juan. I know it's late where you are. I appreciate you taking the time out in your evening and doing this. So thanks for having me. Yeah. So yeah. see you well, next time. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. So perhaps in March. I don't know. You are making this regularly, so um, yeah. Perhaps I can step in yeah. some. Every every weekend at this time, and then uh, I don't know. Saturday nights for me, for us, might work better for you because that's Sunday morning for you. We do it ah, Saturday sure. nights at midnight Eastern. So I think that yeah, perhaps in March. You know, it could be interesting to to talk about where are we standing and and how is yeah. it going. And yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, and and if you did on a Saturday night chat show the farm, you, we could always do a Q and A with you afterward. And yeah, people from idea. the message board could, you know, there, there's a lot of possibilities there. Yeah, that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. uh, Joe had a good idea. I will, um, I will email you about that one and see if, if, you know, make sure that that's okay with you. And if so, we'll, we'll set up a time. And then if, if we can, we'll get you on there at the same time. And like Joe just said, have a discussion and question and answer uh, session with you afterwards. So that would be yeah, great. I mean. I mean, I mean I'm it's sure the fans would love to get a chance to ask questions and and, and hear from from Juan himself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Now I always think that that's why you know as a filmmaker that's so rewarding. You work three three or four years or two years on a film, you can talk with your audience. Uh, oh yeah, you know, absolutely. Like, you know, like it's, it's, it's I, I write. I, I understand. I write. So when I'm done. It gets printed. There's no applause, you know, unless someone directly tells you, "Hey, I like what you wrote. Hey, I like your film." 
you just put it out in the world. You have no idea unless you see a review, of course. Uh, yeah. But that can be it can be really frustrating to just to know whether you know people are seeing your work, how they receive it, um, and it can be unbelievably rewarding to have someone tell you how much your work meant to them. Yes, yeah. definitely. Yes, well, and you know, to get to know that. some people that have the same taste, that's also very, very rewarding. The same taste in terms of film um, storytelling and atmosphere and, and yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, there, there's a big community out there. I think there are at least fifteen thousand people following the e-zine, and that's mostly from the states. So there's other nations we could harness too, maybe. Yeah. Well, I th actually, we're coming up on forty-five thousand. So there's quite that's a great. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, it's, was, it's a I good. Uh, we're talking about other other countries. Yeah, I mean, uh, most of the Lovecraft fans actually are from the United States, uh, definitely. But it's tough to get into France, for, for example. There are many French um, Lovecraft fans uh, because there's a role playing game that's okay. very successful there. But because of the language barrier, I mean, my, my English is not very good. You you hear it. My English is, is your English is just fine. Yeah, you can understand it, <laughs> but my French is even wor worse, so it's very hard to, to talk to Lovecraft and fans uh, fandom there. And Japan, for example, I think there's also a big uh, Lovecraft fan community in Japan, probably. That's true. Yes, there is. But mm -hmm. there's almost no connection on my side, so yeah, if you have something there, perhaps you can help there too, yeah. Juan, have you thought about putting uh, the color out of space, uh, talking to Amazon, uh, is streaming and where people can buy or rent the movie on Amazon or even possibly Netflix uh, here in the States? Um, I think you can uh, watch The Color of Space, Defalba, on, on Amazon. Um, oh, you can. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm sorry, I thought it was just available on DVD. Let me, let me check here. Yeah, I'm quite sure it's, it's possible. Mm -hmm. uh, I think since uh, summer last year or autumn last uh, year. You're right. It is. It's uh, good. So uh, again, for everybody watching, Colorado Space is available on on Amazon um, streaming. That's good. Very good. I'm glad you told me that. I'll spread the word about that too. So good. Uh, okay. Well, I will contact you about possibly showing that one Saturday night and doing a question and answer session with you, and we'll we'll see if that works for you and go from there. So thanks for being here, Juan. I really appreciate right. it. Thanks, and yeah, see you next time. No, All, right. next time. All you got to do to close out uh, when you leave is just click your close X button or whatever, and it'll, it'll mm -hmm. take you out of the room. So. It's great to meet you. He's a nice guy. Yeah, seems like a great guy. Superb English. What does he mean? His English is, is better than yeah, mine. Tell it, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you guys watching the Super Bowl? Well, I actually have to go feed the... Natives are getting restless. They're circling around the door looking at me. <laughs> oh, <no. So laughs> Food is important when you're a kid. Yeah, God, my son is like going to be six feet tall, I think, and it's just like he eats everything. Do you, okay. do you have a score to update us with for those of us? Yeah, it's five nil. Seattle is uh, leading Denver. Oh, they got man, safety on the see, first Mike, play. Mike, you ruined it. I oh, could have been started? watching that, Mike. But no, no, you make me come to these things. <laughs> Has it started already? I thought it hadn't yeah, started. Yeah, it's, it's already into the first quarter. Wow, and I oh, actually man. have viewers? Well, you got the five of us. I mean, I got people watching <laughs> that well, aren't watching. You know, there are mount, there's a mountain of people out there, especially, you know, weird fiction people who aren't sports fans. I mean, they're, that doesn't mean because you like weird fiction you're not a sports fan. But there, there's a lot of people who won't watch the game. Yeah, you know? that's true. Unless they have something invested in it, you know. <laughs> I, I watch the Super Bowl when the Giants are in there. Oh. Well, thanks for being here, Matt. All right. You all take care. Talk to take you care. Soon. Yeah, what have you guys been up to? Uh, oh, I got uh, uh, what was that, a Wall Street Journal article that talked yeah. where uh, the – the guy that wrote uh, True, Detective True Detective talks about a season in Carcosa. Yep, he oh. he uh, mentioned um, writers he likes like Laird and Langan and Simon Stranzis. 
And he said, for people who want to know more about the King and Yellow aspect, they should check out Chambers and Carl Wagner's A River of Night's Dreaming and A Season in Carcosa. I was, hell, I was giddy, you know? Um, you know, I mean, let's face it. We know how much I love the show. Um, from my perspective as a King and Yellow junkie, so far this guy's doing it perfectly. So for him to, you know, in the co course of an interview say, you know, if you want to see what's going on currently, take a look at a season in Carcosa. Man, I'm ready to do the happy dance. Were you going to um, say Rick? Sorry, were you going to say something, Rick? No, that's... Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great that that uh, got mentioned. That should boost some and, sales. And so. one thing, because we were talking about it, yeah, it is great. I'm, I couldn't be more pleased. Um, really, really delighted and thankful. Um, but if you go to the True Detective HBO site, you know, HBO mm -hmm. True Detective, yeah. remember how I was talking about the preacher's speech? Yeah. You yeah. See the, you can see the entirety of the six-minute speech without any of the other material. Because in the speech, they cut away from it and stuff. You can just see the six-minute speech. It's in, and it's the, in, right, the writing is brilliant. Oh, my God. This, this thing is, is like a home run. It, it's... So yeah, that so the stars I'm not the Super Bowl because that means I got to wait another week to see episode four of True Detective. Well, the whole yeah. thing though is we want True Detective to be the hit that it deserves to be. No one in their right mind is going to put it up against the Super Bowl. No, no, I don't. I mean, you know, um, so <clears throat> plus the other thing is is because it's on hiatus for a week, or preempted, or whatever you want to call it, it just gets everybody talking. We miss it so much, you know? Um, but again, like I said, if you go to HBO True Detective, you can see Preacher Thoreau's six-minute speech, uninterrupted, unedited, and it's brilliant. You know, for those of you who've seen the third episode, that is. Yeah. Not, not that it gives anything away. Um, uh, and that does have that, what I consider Lovecraftian quote in it. You know, the, the, the wind the, between the stars. To say, the, the, the actor who played the Reverend is very good. He's also in... He's an excellent actor. Every time I've seen him in something, I think he's always done a wonderful job. Well, Everybody, I, I think the quality, it's, it's not just a great story, but it's brilliantly written. The dialogue is wonderful. We're, we're seeing wonderful characters portrayed by really talented actors. Um, I, you know what, I'm I curious mean, about anyone that watches this show, you guys included. I'm curious about how many of, of us subscribe to, you know, in the first episode, Cole's basically spouting off Thomas Ligotti's... Uh, yeah, the, the conspiracy against the human race. Human race. My yeah. question is, how many, people, how many people out there actually subscribe to this philosophy? I mean, I, I know I do, for the most part. Okay, you know, are, are we accidents? Are con is our consciousness an accident? Well, I asked a biologist that last you night. You cease to exist by stop uh, um, reproducing. Well, you know, I, I, I don't think I, I would take it to the level that I, I don't want to do that. that. I don't want to go there. Yeah. Um, I don't have enough guts to shoot myself. If there was a nice little efficient off switch, there's certainly occasions I would push it so I could just go away. Now, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about you know subscribe. You know, do you recognize the philosophy as valid? Um, as far as accidental um, human consciousness being accident, an accidental 
product of evolution. I actually asked a biologist that last night. I was on PZ Myers' show, and he said, "Yeah, pretty much." He's he's he said, "You know, we evolved big brains, but he said he thinks it's a byproduct of us evolving larger bodies." I won't pretend to understand everything he said, but the gist of it was that yeah, human consciousness is absolutely an accidental. Um, yeah, I agree. Did, did you um, catch uh, Bob Price? Uh, I think you left before Bob Price described. Right when Bob got there, I had to leave. <laughs> his ultimate horror story. Uh -uh. Well, he had. He, he's written a story where um, the protagonist is based on Christopher Hitchens. Bob and his name's, yeah, and he's in the uh, well-known atheist who died recently. Oh right. right. Yeah. A and um, the premise is. That as like the professor in the Call of Cthulhu, the, the protagonist discovers an incredible truth, and the incredible truth is that Roman Catholicism is correct, <laughs> which would be a horror for me. Very horrible. He, right. And I was raised as a Roman Catholic. I would be horrified to find and find out it was correct too. Yeah, yeah. I don't think uh, if you put any thought into it. I mean, yeah, that's just, there's nothing good. That would not be a good situation if it turned out to be uh, the real truth behind the universe. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I'm wondering how many people watch the show and go, oh, yeah, that guy's nuts, uh, that cool guy's nuts, or, you know, uh, or uh, I don't know, that kind of makes sense, or, you know, that, that feel that the same way. Well, when you get to know him better, Cole grows on you. What's that? When you get to know Matthew McConaughey's character better, he grows on you. The first, oh, yeah. you know, the first when I was first watching, I'm going, Woody's the normal guy, and and Matthew's the nutcase, and then, as you said before, it gets reversed. Right. Well, I, we were perfectly set up for that, though. Mm -hmm. in, in the first episode, they set us up. You know, McConaughey's the unreliable narrator. He's unhinged. And Woody's, you know, solid as a rock, American, you know, and then we turn we turn the tables. So we, where we're going, because right now it's a juggling act, you know. It's like certainly McConaughey's still an unreliable narrator, but he's more solid than um, than uh, Woody Harrelson. So. It's a crapshoot which way we're going, so, which you know, is like, wonderful. I mean, we're, we're doing mystery uh, on multiple levels here. It just shows the quality of the work, before you know, they go of the writing. The church, at, the, um, at the end of episode two, before they go into the church, um, you know, Matthew McConaughey sees these these birds doing that, that uh, weird uh, thing. Yeah, a weird sign or whatever it is in the sky. Are we saying for sure that's a hallucination, or? Uh, it... no. Um, but our minds play tricks on us, mm -hmm. and at, and at that point we're perceiving it through the unreliable narrator's viewpoint, um, or it's just an accident. Yeah. Of nature, like like we are. We are an accident of nature, and here is something that we see as a sign or coincidental, but it's only an accident. And we're interpreting it to be something that perhaps it's not. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're really lucky with this show. What we have is a guy who has a ton of talent writing it. His interests, be it Ligotti, Lovecraft, Barron, um, Carl Edgar Wagner, Chambers, we're, we're getting this very nice and wonderfully presented uh, smorgasbord of, of, of weird fiction. Um, you know, if if he can maintain this, and at this point, after three episodes, I see no reason to doubt that this isn't going to continue to be 
just as engaging as it's been. Uh, we're we're in for a a hell of a show. We we really are. I mean, this is like a weird fiction uh, holiday for us. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, it's going to be good no matter what way it goes. I uh, I wish it would. I I hope that it ends up with some sort of supernatural element, but my my gut tells me it's not going to. No, I, I, I don't think it is. I like I've said before. I think what we're going to get is just this whisper. You know. Um, now, if Rick's thought from the other day proves to be true, we're going to need to buy him a, a, a drink. You know how you mentioned Tuttle and, and the mask of Hastur. Yeah. Uh, that would just be another wonderful, wonderful little thing to bring in. And we're only three episodes in. we got five more episodes this season. So if we've brought in uh, Sticks, Carl Edgar Wagner, if we've brought in Ligotti, if we've brought in Lovecraft, if we've brought in The King in Yellow, in three episodes, what what might we expect in five more? What were you going to say, Rick? Well, I was well. F first of all, I was thinking that that Tuttle family is going to be uh, not as religious or or Christian as they make out to be. Well, Tuttle's going to be Jimmy Swagger for crying out loud. You know, he's going to have a hooker on every arm. Well, I think they got some. You know, they they. Well, there are all these little hints that you know they own they own this church, they own that uh, yeah. school. That somehow they're going to be behind these murders. Right. Yeah, you and, guys remember um, what was it episode two, one or two? I don't remember, but they find the uh, basically the Carl Edward Wagner sticks uh, um, in the shed behind that house and the people living in the house don't don't know how it got there. I'm really curious in the context of this story what what that's going to rep ultimately represent. You know. Mm. Yeah, well. And why know. is it in this particular shed? Jesus. Mm. But what does the disappearance of the girl have to do with the two murders we we so far know about? Well, you know, Again, it's we're three hours into. Is that what they are? Hour episodes? Yeah. So we're three hours into an eight. We're three hours into an eight-hour film. We're not even halfway through the movie yet. Yeah. You know. Um, uh, and and I think that the portrayal of McConaughey and and Woody. You know, now we're starting to see Woody Harrelson's character become unhinged. Um, I think that bodes well for this guy is I'm sure he's got other rabbits to pull out of his hat. Um, look, look, we have that final scene in episode three. If that's not a tip of the hat to Texas Chainsaw Massacre, I don't know what is. Where will that lead us? You know? Um, we're, I, I don't know, I, I just absolutely adore this show. Um, I, I hope it doesn't ever really get supernatural. I would like it to, when all is said and done, just be this whiff. You know, have the very slight chance that perhaps... Yeah, I think that's what's going to happen. Yeah, and I, I, yeah, I, I do too. I I'm, that, pretty, yeah. I'm convinced. <clears throat> Boy, is it a nice ride getting there so far. I, I prefer that it's not overtly supernatural. Yeah, I, I don't want it to be. I want the merest possibility that it might be, you know? It, I mean, it, 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 it can't just be cult activity. You know, it's a, it's, it's a cult, and but that's this it. Guy, this guy who's writing this show has got so much talent, he can easily sew it up for us in a realistic manner and yet still leave us with that vapor of possibility of, in the supernatural. You know? Um, I, I think that's evident throughout these last three hours of the yeah, show. Yeah, I'm fine with I'm fine with that. I just don't want a, um, an ending where everything's wrapped up and I don't think we that's really going to happen here anyway. So, 
you know, everything's explained. It's all, um, you know, there's no possibility of anything. Well, super you know, might be might be wonderful if it's not all perfectly explained. Right. Exactly. You know, let us at the end of the season walk away talking about it, thinking about it, open to interpretation. Um, that's and that's a distinct possibility too. You know, uh, I mean, he's. We already know there was a resolution, but oh, wait a minute, folks! We got more killings going on since the resolution, so, you know. Yeah. There's a lot of presents under this Christmas tree, and we've only opened a few of them so far. Let me let me try to draw Pete into this because he hasn't seen the show. Oh, no, why he didn't? I, I was trying to think, Pete, of uh, mythos stories that are non-supernatural. Like uh, Men with No Ears. Who, oh, that one, I wasn't thinking of that one. Who wrote that? Cutner. Uh, the Skull with No Ears. Skull, oh, oh, The Skull Has No Ears. Yeah, skull yeah. Has No Ears, yeah. Yeah, um, where it was a Dagon cult. Yeah. Did you ever read The Great Vor by Basil Copper? Yes, I have. That was, was a cult of the great old ones where they worship an octopus to all intents and purposes. Right. It was sort of a Sherlock Holmes style. No, it was not supernatural. Right. But right. it was murdering cultists. Yeah, and there, yeah, there's a few others. Um, Michael Slade's uh, The Ghoul. Yeah. Yeah, the first, the first book. Right. Yeah. Um, they did, they did a good job on that. Um. Yeah, which came out about the same time as yours, Joe, if I remember correctly. Yeah, and yeah, well, you know what's funny is that came out, Mr. X came out, and right. mine came out. And, and I, I can remember getting a big chuckle because Bob liked mine best of the three, <laughs> whereas I liked I liked Straub's best of the three. I thought Mr. X was jaw-dropping. Yeah, Matt keeps saying that we ought to put that in the book club and discuss Mr. X. Uh, if, if you haven't read Mr. X, you need to. It's, it's, it's just wonderful. Straub is one of our best. I mean, there, you, you don't get to do what he's doing without having the amount of talent he does. Um, and, and, you know, that first, the first Slade book, Ghoul, was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. the, the whole problem with the series is Along about book three, you got the two Royal Canadian Mounted Policemen in the motor vehicle, in the car, and they're driving, and I think they're only going like 15 blocks or something, and it's windy, and it's rainy, and it takes like six pages to drive there. You know, we went by the, you know, number 151, which was a brownstone with an iron grate and dying roses. And then we went by 187, and, you know, that it would, little white wind. It, it's like, it was like reading Tom Clancy only as, as a, you know, driving down the street. It's, yeah, it's like well, we, don't need to, we don't need six pages to go 15 blocks, especially when there's not a lot going on between the two characters in the car. Yeah, the Michael Slade book, I mean, Michael Slade itself, that whole, is, is an interesting concept. Oh, yeah. It, it, it's not a person. Right. It, it's a, I, I thought it was originally three people. Right, and I, from what I understand, those people have, have rotated in and out. With yeah, because at one point, one of them's daughter or something became one right. of the writers. Right. Right. Yeah, it's, it's. It's 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 it, almost like it's a round robin, you know. <laughs> it, it's almost um, like the whole VC Andrews thing, but planned. Yeah. Or like uh, um, the old the old pulp magazines with house names. Right. Um, but I, I I did like the first one, and the second one, if it was a movie, would have been a good popcorn movie, and then then they get less and less as they go on. Right. I've only read the first. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, Headhunter wasn't bad either. 
Um, right. No, okay, those three. Yeah. Those first three. Um, but but you do lose a little. Absolutely. Every book. Yep. And along about four or five, it's like, because six, number six or number seven, I didn't even bother with. Mm -hmm. And Hangman, which I think is number five, I don't think I finished. Yeah. I was um, like, yeah. The other book that comes to mind is Umberto Eco's book called Pendulum. Yeah, which is phenomenal. Which, yeah, it, and sits on my Lovecraft shelf. Yeah. Because it does. <laughs> it's it's a Lovecraftian novel. Is, sure that, is. is that part of his series or is that standalone? No, it's a standalone. It's a standalone. Okay, uh, um, I'm going to read that then. Yeah, you need to read that. Now, have you... Have you guys all you guys all read Daniel Lewski's House of Leaves, right? I I have not. Uh, I started it a couple of times, but that is one long book. It's one brilliant book, and in some ways the most Lovecraftian thing I've ever read. Uh, Pete, that's yeah. You okay. Don't get more Lovecraftian, brother. All right. You know, it, it, that came out about the same time as The Red Tree. No, it didn't. Didn't it? No, this book's... Hang on, hang on. You're going to make me pull it out, aren't you? Yeah, I am. Come on, come on, come on. Talk to me. 2000. This is the first edition, first hardcover. And how many? Out, I, I believe it came out January, February. Yeah, it was March of 2000. How many pages is that? Let's see if we're hearing um, it. I got to look. I will be right back, you guys. Okay. Oh, come on, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, it's small. 760. Is that really book? Is that book really fourteen years old now? Yeah. And 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 of course, just when Joe was starting, Joe was just starting to be Joe. That's when we started to get stuff like this. Yeah. Yeah. And I went, you know, I mean. That's it. One paragraph on two pages. And then you get to a page and you're reading it this way and you gotta turn it upside down or you gotta turn it this way to read it. The book requires you to interact with it. Erections in other dimensions. Yep. You're reading along and all of a sudden Dead center in the middle of the page is a box with a footnote. Go to page 342, and you go to page 342, and you have to turn the book upside down to read it, and that tells you go to page 82. <laughs> and when you get to the, the page 82, you got to turn it sideways, and that tells you go to 567. And what that footnote tells you, you can't make sense of. Yeah. It's like a literary dead end. But in the context of this story, that kind of stuff is perfect. The whole book is unreliable. The hell with unreliable narrator. It's an unreliable narr narrative. But it's... And and don't forget, as we're going along, you know, top of the page is one story. You, you know, we have multiple storylines going on here. You know, this thing is as rich as Moby Dick in its way. What are we talking about? House of Leaves? Yeah. We're still House in House of Leaves. Um, which I think is utterly brilliant. Um, uh, I I think every Lovecraftian, you know, if you want to take a take a look at postmodern Lovecraftian, there you go. 
I, w I would assume yeah. that's more Lovecraftian than Mythos. Of oh, Mythos? No, 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 no. I, I just it's Lovecraftian it's theme. Yeah, They're in the there. Yeah. By but the way, this guy didn't, this guy didn't set out to ape Lovecraft. You know, it just. So, but um, yeah, a great, great book. I can't believe yeah, you didn't read that, Pete. I would have thought you would have yeah, jumped yeah, yeah. all over that. I've sold several copies, but you know, I just, I haven't pick, bothered to pick it up. It yet. takes a lot of patience sometimes to read a seven hundred page book. I've, I've yeah. picked through a few of those. Yeah, but yeah. the whole thing is, is, is that kid Joey Pulver? You know, he's twelve, he's thirteen, and and all of a sudden he's given. Dune and Lord of the Rings and Stranger in a Strange Land and I really like these big fat immersive books or or when I read the John Carter books I read them all together as if it was a single narrative um, Lee Brackett's The Ginger Star books yeah, all three I read together as if they were a single story. Um, you know, if it, if it's if it's really good, um, I want, when appropriate, a big fat book. I want to get lost in that world. If 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 the story's good enough, if the writer's talented enough, you know, take take me for a very long ride, please. Um, you know, I mean, Flickr is well, one of my yeah, favorites. It is. Um, I'll take another crack at it. I've got a copy. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. And there's all these side. Uh, I mean. Yeah. Yes. Side things and. I mean, wow. You do not idly read this book. I think it's um the not that it's it's Lovecraftian, but. I think it's Chip Kids Cheese Monkeys. If you read the book, you'll notice that at the bottom of the pages there's tiny little figures. Okay. And if you actually take the time and use it as a flip book, there's a little there's a little film. Bottom of the page. Not not in House of Leaves. Not in House of Leaves. In, oh, I'm sorry. Chip Kids Cheese Monkeys. Yeah. Oh, Cheese Monkeys. Um. But you know what's funny is, as 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 incredible as House of Leaves is, I found only Revolutions. I just scratch my head. It's like, excuse me, huh? Joe, I didn't know you were one of the authors on House of Leaves. Excuse me? <laughs> oh yeah. I'm not the I'm not the only psycho in the universe. I'm sorry. We never These said are, you were the only one. We just said that you were a big one. Um, Kiernan. This is Kiernan why it's such a big book. Pages. No, I'm kidding. This wait a minute. Wait a minute. Caitlin Kiernan has pages that look like that. John Fowles has pages that look like that. Yeah. 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 Um, well, no, it can't be you. Okay, here's 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 here's, here's an author's note on that book. I had just finished um, my Cisco tribute. What the hell's the name of it, Joe? Hurry up, come on. Um, pitch nothing. That's it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then I got House of Leaves for a present. A couple of three weeks later. And I went back into Pitch Nothing, and I changed the two story the the font of the second storyline because of House of Leaves. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I I love House of Leaves. I I could. Um, other books that we could talk about. Um, Preston's Relic and Reliquary. Or, uh, I've, Those are, um, I find very Lovecraftian. They have a a. Didn't read it. You mean uh, Pete? You're saying without the supernatural elements, but they're Lovecraftian. Yeah, there there's a little bit of a, a there's a monster thing to it. So I've, but 
one, one thing I was going to suggest if we're thinking about things for the book club, you know, I, I sent that website out called Tales of Mystery and Imagination on uh, the oh, message yeah. board. Uh, Midnight Meat Train is on there. Oh, nice. So you can, we, we could all have access to it and read it, and it's, it's a novella, you know, it's not that long, but it's all of crafty and in print than it was in film. Yeah. Um, the other story that Barker writes that I think is Lovecraftian is uh, The Madonna. Never read that. And then also um, The Skins of the Fathers. But um, he, he borders on it a lot. But he doesn't, you know, a lot of his work is, I don't, a lot of people argue that the Cenobite universe is Lovecraftian. Uh, I, I the satellite think universe? What? Cenobite. No, he, he Cenobite. means the Hellraiser. Hellraisers. Right? Oh, 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 okay. All right. Well, they yeah. were so, they were sort of in uh, Cabin in the Woods, if you think about it. Right. It, yes. Um, I I don't agree. I can see how you can make the argument. I just I just don't. Um. I, yeah, I'm with you. I I don't I don't see that. Yeah. To me, that universe is too anthropocentric. It revolves completely around humanity. Yeah, that, that's not a crowd mm -hmm. game. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, well, you um, get into a debate on how Earth should fit in the mythos fiction, because on the one hand, there's the, you know, F. Paul Wilson premise where it's really a meaningless marble that two sides are fighting over. Yeah, it's just one but, more marble. But if you go back to Lovecraft, it's important because that's where Cthulhu is. Right. And, and the question is, is well, if you look at the history, you know, first it's the elder things, and then the great race, and Cthulhu and his ilk come down, and then the Maigo come to visit. And given the number of things that come to Earth, you can't say that it's not important. But what yeah. if all these things come... My question is, what if all these things that are coming to Earth, the number of them, that's just... I mean, that's just, Earth is just one more planet they're coming to, or creatures or monsters like them. Maybe there is nothing special about Earth. We just know they're all coming to Earth because we're right. here. Well, and we're, we're not aware that they're on planet Zubob in the right. you know, next well, I can, galaxy I can, I can buy that was the Mygo or uh, the Krell, as Pete calls them. Or, <laughs> but, Somebody but, had to give them the name. But but the great wraith of Yith at least settled here, and uh, so did Cthulhu. Right. So it's, you know, it's not yeah, like... Well, you know, no, I, I agree, but up. what if there's other great races exact, you know, similar to the Yith? I'm just saying Earth isn't special. It's just we think it is because we see these creatures coming here, oh, but yeah. they're, they're coming and, everywhere. And, and we got, I like them coming everywhere. Yeah, you I know. mean, that's my problem, is along with them, we got Nug and Yeb are here, you know, uh, Lumley's creations are here. They're, my God, this is grand central for these things. You know, I mean, Men in Black, this is the hub. Yeah. They, they, they probably all came know. here so they could read Lovecraft Beezine, right? <laughs> probably. <laughs> Or, uh, or, did they, or, or did they all come here because Cthulhu came here and then uh, maybe he had a lot of enemies and they wanted to grab parts of his territory before he got I think but one, one of these shows, all, all you folks who watch the Ezine chats, one of these shows, Mike Davis will slip and you will finally see the mask come off and see the true face of Nair Lafayette. <laughs> I thought you were going to say, like, the festival, there'll be a worm underneath there. <laughs> well, it could be, too. I mean, you know, I'm hopefully, hopefully I'll be sleeping that night and, you know, be I won't have, I won't I won't have all my sanity yeah. points taken away. Uh, you know, this would be a good idea for a chat, but how and when did the, these entities evolve? I mean, obviously, not too long. Uh, you need to read Pulver there. In the Mountains of Madness. Yeah, and... and well, whenever that comes out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I have my own theories, too. Yeah, right. I, I want to hear them. Um, 
I'm going to... Co- do you remember, um, and Joe might remember, remember The Stranger from Marvel Comics? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I remember him. He was a conglomerate. He was a rep- okay. he was he was his entire species. Oh, like the Overmind yeah. or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think that you could take that concept and merge it with um, a little bit of David Brin and Werner Vinge, and you can think of the old ones like Cthulhu and 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 these guys as as singularity events, mm-hmm. where well, an, an entire species suddenly became more than just what they were, became able to bend space and time to their own will. The universe so, started, they, they stopped... They, they evolved this way, Pete. They didn't reach a, a, a technological state it, it, where they were a super civilization. They evolved this way. You could get there, you know, if you look at the uh, what Vinji and, and Haldeman and Bryn, Bear, and Benford all talk about, you can get there a lot of different ways. Mm-hmm. Technology, art, science, philosophy, yeah. you can get to that state oh, by a variety of paths. But once you hit that state, there's no going back. Once you hit that singularity event, you are not part of the universe anymore. You're in control of the universe. Hmm. Did you you remember the Guardian of the Book by Henry Hess? Yes. Have you yeah. ever tried to wonder what the heck was going on there? What he intended with that Cthulhu type character? Who's I, in you it? know, it, it's kind of funny because I, I I think about it and yeah, it's I think that's what he's talking about. That he's talking about this is the this is the world that existed before they became what they became. Right, because he had this character whose name was sort of like Cthulhu, and at the end they associated with him. He was living on this right. planet, who's a scientist or something, a scholar who opens the doorway to, uh, I think they call them mem ones rather than great old ones. Right. And all of a sudden he's found dead, but it looks like his brain had been taken out or something. Yep. I'm wondering, you know, did he somehow, you know, and later they say, you know, it isn't, it isn't coincidental that his name is almost the same as Cthulhu, who came down from the star. So I'm going, right. is he supposed, at least in Hass's mind, whether this would be, you know, whether we should accept this as mythos, canon is a different question. Right. That so, he sort of became Cthulhu? You know, if, if you read my story in um, uh, Future Lovecraft, Mm-hmm. You know, I have it, I have the human race hit that singularity event. Yeah, and they become the the great old one that they were always meant to be. Yeah, the one that is most like us. Right. How um how likely it is? How likely do you guys think it is that we are going to hit a singularity? Um sometime in the next century because, you know, with, with, I mean, the snowball effect of technology, it seems pretty likely to me, you know. And, and is this what actually happens to alien species? Is that we either, ex- you know, a lot of people think that we just go extinct because we reach a technology level and somebody blows blows the world up. Mm, right. Well, but you- is it possible that instead of that was we hit a, te- a, a technology level and we just move on. We retire from the day-to-day running of the universe to do other things. Remember Babylon 5? Yeah. Do we become Vorlons in a sense? Yeah. Um, More energy? Yeah. Because that was, that was the ultimate future on Babylon 5 for mankind. They jumped way into the future in one episode, and we became Vorlons to all intents and purposes. Right, right. That lo- one of the episodes, very near the end, the humans, most of the human species, the ones that didn't remain on the planet, became almost pure energy. Yeah. And the rest of the planet uh, went into a dark age. Because of an atomic war. Right. Or the equivalent. Hmm. I don't know. We are stardust, we are golden. I don't think so. 
Don't think so. What? I said, we are stardust. We are golden. I don't think so. Well, we're definitely stardust. <laughs> well, I'm talking about in, you know, that we transcend and become something more. I, I, no. Um, well, that's, well, there's also the issue of whether one man will just do that, which is, you know, the first episode right. of Star Trek. Yeah. Well, uh, plus... You know, we, you know, this fuzzy uh, blue ball we live on, you know, there, there's all kinds of things that can go wrong, not just us. Right. You know, Yos let's say Yosemite really pops its cork. Uh, what's left the year after that? You know, cockroaches? Well. Or an asteroid hits us. Yeah. I mean, um, we have evidence that all of that's happened in the past, and life goes on. Mm -hmm. Right, but not us. Not, n maybe not us. You know, that's why I said cockroaches or something. You know? You know, the sharks, if you think about it, cockroaches, sharks, alligators, they're great survivors. Yeah. Turtles, Turtles have done a fabulous, and, and frogs, they've done a fabulous job up until now. Well, it seems to me the frogs are. We're we're making sure frogs won't. Uh, yeah, we're doing something right now. Get another crack at the wheel. Right, right. But we, but we, but I guess we could have turtles, and then <laughs> then it'll really be mutant ninja turtles. Hmm. Uh, Easy Meyer said he'd be, he'd come on the show sometime. He's exactly the kind of guy to talk to about this stuff. He, he's a biologist. And yep. Earlier you were talking about intelligence. Yeah. And you know, I can't. Re I think it's a David Brin story, and I can't remember the title of it. But there's a, a story he wrote where there's two astronauts who go into this. They find there's this thing floating in space, and it's a hive of all these different life forms that are living together. Mm -hmm. But they're all animals. They're they're like worker drones. It's like a an ant hive. Mm -hmm. And so they're they're they are investigating it and moving in through the hive, and eventually they find this chamber in the center of the of the hive, and there's nothing there. And then there is, and they start talking to it, and it's like, yeah, we're go we're coming to Earth, and uh, we're gonna wipe you out because. The history of the universe shows that intelligence is detrimental to life. Except and for us, of course. <laughs> They're saying no, no, no. And he says, and he says, the only reason I'm intelligent right now is because the hive has created me. Oh. Take care okay. of you. And when I'm when we're done, I will go away. Hmm. I can't disagree. I mean, look at what intelligent life has done to the planet. Earth. Yeah, and this is this is kind of kind of if it if it is a David Brin story, it's kind of counter to his his uplift universe, where there's intelligent species traveling universe, finding things that are almost sentient and making them intelligent. Here it's a complete opposite. It's non sentience finding life that's intelligent and saying, no, we don't need that. Uh, very different kind of thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in. Uh, and in some ways, kind of Lovecraftian. <laughs> oh yeah. In uh, Watchmen, what is it? Uh, Doctor Manhattan says uh, Mars gets along just fine without so much as a microbe. Right. Right. You know, and and we were talking about that singularity event, and could one person do it? I think that Dr. Manhattan is a perfect example of what that would be like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and later on, he doesn't even, if you remember, uh, when Ozymandias tries to kill him, he says that, and he comes comes right back and he says, um, uh, I forget the word he used, but basically he says, putting myself back together was the first trick I learned. He goes, right. it, didn't, it didn't work on, what's the guy's name? 
I can't remember. John somebody. The, the, the schizoid guy? Or? No, no, John, no, no, John, Manhattan. Manhattan's real name. Manhattan's real name. But he basically says it didn't work on, he basically says it didn't work on John. It, did you really think it would work on me? You know, basically saying he's no longer that person. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I thought that was very interesting. Yeah, and, and, and you know, what you're watching is not only how Ozymandias deals with Manhattan, but Manhattan's slow loss of his humanity as he realizes what he has really become. And, and you know, that's that storyline that he does with where he's not just where he is, he's at all moments of his existence. Mm hmm that's really bizarre. John Osterman. John Osterman. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, he goes, it, it, didn't, dest it didn't destroy Osterman. Did you think really think it would have destroyed right. me? But if, if you think about that timeless nature where he's experiencing everything and he has to keep just, his consciousness has to sort it out so that he can deal with people, mm -hmm. I mean, isn't that the old ones are, the old ones were, and the old ones shall be? Wow, that's a great point. Mm -hmm. That is a great point. It, it, isn't he just, you know, I'm here, I'm there, uh, and I'm then. He's Yogg Stothoff. Yeah. He says. Sure. Mm -hmm. he's, he's, huh. he's our start down that path. Yeah, he's definitely a great example of it. Hmm. hmm. I, you know, just as an aside, too, I really, you know, some people didn't, but I really thought the change in the story from the graphic novel, novel to the movie where Dr. where Ozymandias uses Dr. Manhattan as the pretend threat instead of this weird Cthulhu-like creature. Don't and, blow the story for me. <laughs> oh, just, sorry, you, you haven't read I'm it? Just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, you read it. I mean... The, no, I'm, not, I'm not really giving away too much, but I just thought it was it was a good change. Yeah. Uh, you know, I thought that made more sense. Simplified it. Yeah. Right? Also, also, the the whole idea comes from the Outer Limits. We should point out. Yeah. From uh, the Robert Culp episode that I don't it's title I don't remember. Not Demon was the Glass Hand, the one that wasn't written by Harlan Ellison. Or yeah, a group. I don't think I've. I don't remember that one. Basically, it was a group of. Um, Millionaires decide the way to unite the human race is to pretend that we're, we, we face alien invasion, so they turn right. Robert Culp into this horrible alien-like creature who's going to land on Earth and threaten to uh, destroy it. <coughs> that way all of mankind would then unite to yeah. repel the invasion that will never come. Mm. Yeah, well, it's a valid idea. Yep. Mm. I mean, because that is exactly the way the humans would react. You know, there might be some minor yeah. squabbles, but for the most part, they would unite against um, this exterior threat. Oh yeah, look at and look at America at in World War Two. All the divisions, you know, North, South, Black, White, East, yeah, West. It's human nature. You know, um, um, and all of a sudden, it's like, don't you dare touch him. He's American. Mm -hmm. It's not that he's black. It's not that he's southern. It's not that you know that guy's from Boston or whatever. It's like you know we're American. It's us versus them. And um, from a world from the wagons, there's there's this great beast at the entrance of the cave. What, Rick? I was saying from another perspective, we also threw anti-communism out the window for a while. Right. Stalin yeah. was her uncle. Yeah. Uncle Joe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, you know the the if, have you ever read Colossus the the, the three books in the Colossus series? Um, I've only seen the movie. Okay, so yeah, me too. But uh, I, I know I know where you're headed though, because I know right it's because it's it's it, it touches on this because what happens is that you know in the first book um, the Americans build Colossus this robot to take over our military. And the Russians build Vanguard or Guardian to do the same thing, and they both get turned on at the same time. 
And the first thing they, thing they do is they talk to each other. They shake hands, and then they, you know, they take over. And they basically shoot everybody who won't follow their orders. Mm. And they rapidly, rapidly over the course of two or three books, well, through the first book and the second book, they rapidly uh, turn the, the world into a military uh, production factory. They're building weapons and, and warheads and whatnot. What for? And to repel an alien invasion. To repel an alien invasion, which we didn't notice. Oh, because we're too busy fighting amongst ourselves. Yeah. Mm. But yeah. They, they noticed it as soon as they were, they were turned on. But they could not see how they, they could possibly convince the world that this was going to happen. So instead, they just took over and forced it. So they turn out being not as evil as we originally right. thought. Right. They're that oh, benign God. dictatorship. I don't remember hearing about these. At all. Who wrote these? And there's a movie, too? Yeah, the, the movie was called Colossus the Forbin Project. And I think Forbin yeah, was the right. Forbin was played by Eric Braden. Right, when exactly. Oh, D.F. Jones. D.F. Jones wrote. What's that? I think they were written by D.F. Jones. Yeah, that name sounds familiar, D.F. Jones. When did the movie come out? Uh, 70s. Mm. Oh, yeah, early 70s, it seems like. Colossus. 71 or 72. Yeah. 71 or 72. I was in high school when it came out. Okay. And it's really not a bad movie. It just. Not like the, 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 the only thing, not when like I was watching it, I found it ended abruptly, but that was the appropriate ending. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, here it is. I mean, I, have, I haven't seen it in, what, 40 years? 88% no, on the Rotten Tomatoes. That's my re my uh, recollection, it was really good. It's a nice, well, it's a nice, well-made science fiction movie. Yeah, yeah. Huh. Hmm. See, audience, well, you, guys, you learn so I'm, much. I'm going, I'm going because I got a headache that I just can't okay. shake. Oh, it says here so, Will Smith is gonna remake Colossus: The Forbidden Project. That could be. <laughs> I don't there know about that. Wow. Well, I thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to. I, I thought it was going to be Tom yeah. Cruise. It says here Will Smith, but I tell you what, <laughs> After Earth, I heard was just a whole pile of crap. His latest movie, sci-fi upper. Which one? Uh, the After Earth with his no. son in it. Oh uh, yeah, I was not impressed with that. Neither was a lot of people. Yeah. Right. Joe, okay, take care of yourself. You. Take care, take All right, care, I'll Joe. I'll see you guys soon. Good night. All right. Oh, Good night. wait, Joe. Oh, then never mind. I'm gonna. <laughs> I, I've been told I can promote something. So, can yeah. I take thirty seconds? Yeah, go right ahead. Come For on. the HP Lovecraft Film Festival, Joe and I are writing around Robin, and. Um, it includes Cody Goodfellow, Sylvia Moreno Garcia, uh, Nick Mamatas. Um, I think uh, Willem is in there. So yeah, I'm not sure. There you go. And it's going to be published in there. They're going to. Is Lance Langmaker publishing that in something? I I don't think Lance has anything to do with this one. Oh okay. So, how do people get a copy of that? Is that part of the Kickstarter? It's part remember. of the Kickstarter rewards. Yeah, I hope they make it. Kickstarter. Um, they made it in first 24 hours. <laughs> I know. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm just being funny. He's, he's, he's just pulling our legs. Don't pull. Yeah. Don't mess with me, Mike. Yeah, Gwen and he's Brian like were very something. happy. Yeah. And and it's still they still got like 26 days to go. That's great. That's great. Um, you got to keep conventions like this going. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, thanks for being on the show, guys. I will talk to you guys yeah, on Mike. Thursday. So. Yeah. See you Thursday. All right. Thanks for watching, everybody. Talk to you guys soon. Oh.